me My feet gives way And I hear the sound Of crashing waves And all my world is washing Out to sea I'm hidden safe In the God who never Moves, holding fast To the promise of the truth You are holding Tighter still to me And the rock won't move and his word is strong The rock won't move and his love can't be undone The rock won't move and his word is strong The rock won't move and his love can't be undone The rock of our salvation a series called Fearless, and today Bill is going to be talking to us about how we can be fearless in the face of life's choices. And the thing we need to remember this morning is the fact that we face a choice every single day. We have to choose, are we going to trust ourselves, or are we going to trust God? And so many times we get ourselves in trouble because we think we know that we have the answers to all the things that life throws at us. But Jesus was telling us in Matthew 7 how dangerous that can be because he was comparing it to wise builders and foolish builders. And he says, those who trust in themselves are like the foolish builder who builds their house on the sand. And so that when the storms of life come and all the difficult situations come, your house is gonna be torn apart. But those who trust in God are like the wise builder who builds their house on the rock. And so when the storms of life come and everything comes your way that's trying to defeat you, that's trying to destroy you, that's trying to make you give up, it won't knock you down because you built on the rock. And that's the choice that we have every single day. Are we gonna trust God or are we gonna trust ourselves? We need this morning to choose to be wise. We need to choose to trust. And we need to choose to stand on the rock because the rock won't move. And that's why we praise him this morning. So think about all the choices that you're facing and say, guess what, God, I'm trusting you because you won't move. And that's why I'm singing. And Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. The rock won't move. No, the rock won't seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace the rock won't move no the rock won't move sing it out on Christ the solid rock I stand on love and ground the sinking sand the rock
You know, one of the greatest thoughts that I think could ever cross anyone's mind is the idea that God doesn't just love all of us, which he does, but he loves each one of us. God loves us individually. He loves us specifically. God has an incredible plan for each and every life. In fact, he loved us before we knew him. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, while we were alienated from him, while we were away from him, he says he loved us. So it's an amazing thing to be able to gather on a Sunday morning to be reminded of the fact that yes, God loves all of us, but the beautiful idea is he loves each one of us. In fact, I believe that so strongly, I don't think it's an accident you're in this room. I think the providence of God brought you here this morning because there was something specifically for your life that he wanted you to know. Now, it may have been a moment in the worship where you had this moment with God, where you connected with him and said, you know, that's really what I needed to hear. That's what I needed to think about. That's, that's how I needed to feel. That's what I needed to know. Or it may be something that we say in the course of our time together that God will reveal something to you that you haven't considered or you haven't thought about, maybe to encourage you, maybe to instruct you, maybe to correct you. But this morning, I just believe with all my heart, God knows exactly who we are. He knows where we are. He knows what we are going through. And he has a definite, specific plan for each individual life. Now, when you talk about that, it, it almost seems to, to kind of blow your mind to think about this God, this infinite God, the God who stepped out of nowhere to stand on nothing and spoke everything into existence, this God who uh, created all things, who sustains all things, this God who created life and sustains life, that same God could love me. That same God could care about the things I care about, could love you, to care about the things you care about. I mean, it almost blows your mind to really consider that fact. In fact, there are many who are like the deist, who believe that God did create everything, that God is above and beyond all things, but he's not intimately involved in everything. Uh, they kind of view God as like the one who constructs the train set, like on Christmas morning, you put the track together and you set the train on the track and you turn it on and it just goes on this well-prescribed uh, uh, path and it just goes and goes and goes and you are watching it and observing it but from a distance, but you're not intricately involved with it. And there are people who view God that way. They say, well, I think God did create everything and I believe that he is above all things, but I don't think God is intimately in, in, interested in, in little things, particularly things that interest me. So I, I believe he's above it, but I don't believe he's involved in it, right? In other words, I believe God is transcendent. I believe he is out there and I believe he's above these things. I believe in a God, but I just cannot accept the fact that a God who is transcendent could also be imminent, that he could be involved in my life, that he could actually care about the things I care about, that he could actually prescribe a direction for my life, that he could give definition to my life. It's hard for people to wrap their minds around that. But that is exactly what the Apostle Paul addressed when he wrote in Ephesians chapter four in verse six, he said concerning God, God is above all, he is transcendent, <laughs> he is out there, he is created, he has created all things, he is above everything, but he also said he is working through all. And then I like the way he phrased it. He said, he is also in you all. Paul must have been a southerner, right? In you all, in y'all. So you could honestly say this same God who is transcendent is at the same time imminent. This God who does see the big picture and has a plan for all things is involved intricately and intimately in the little details of your life. I think it's obvious when the Bible says he sees the little sparrow when he falls. When he says the hairs of your head are numbered. When you read verses like that, what I think he's trying to communicate to us this morning is he cares about the little things in our life. He cares about the stressors of our life. He cares about the things we care about. And with that in mind, I would say to you this morning that this God who is above all and working all things to his pleasure, is also involved in all, and he cares about the little things of your life. To such a degree, as Jeremiah said, he has a plan for your life, specific, unique, 
powerful. God has a great plan for your life. And so what I want to challenge you, I hope it's a challenge, to do in the next few moments we're together is to be fearless in the face of life's choices. Because we have many. And we have choices every day in relationships, in business partnerships, in fellowship with one another. All of us have choices. And I believe with all my heart, it is the desire and the design of God for us that we are fearless in the face of those choices. I believe this morning it is possible to know God's specific, unique, and definite will for your life. It's possible to know that. Now, when you use a term like the will of God, I think I need to color that a little bit and define that and explain that. When you look in the scripture concerning the will of God, it involves what I would call, first of all, a sovereign will, a sovereign will meaning that God is at work prophetically. He is at work in the affairs of mankind. God has set certain things in order that will happen. His will will be done. In Proverbs, he says, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it whithersoever he wills. God can use those who reject him in a way to bring about his will. When Pharaoh's heart was hardened, God in turn hardened Pharaoh's heart even more. And he used wicked Pharaoh to accomplish his own purposes. Um, All the way in the New Testament with Judas, who was the treasurer, who was one of the uh, apostles, who was one of the followers, at least on the surface, seemingly was a follower of Christ. Even though Judas rejected Jesus, God used the rejection and the betrayal of Judas to accomplish his purpose. What's my point? My point is there is a sense in which there is a sovereign will in this world today that is at work, and his will will be done. (laughs) In prophecy, his will will be done. So when you think about the will of God, think about it, first of all, as being a sovereign thing. It is a sovereign will. Now, Now let's break that down another step. You not only have the sovereign will of God, but you have what let's call the standard will of God. The Ten Commandments, for example. The command that he said, you shall go and be my witnesses. The command that he said in Hebrews, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as many do. But so much more as you see evil days approaching, referring to a commitment to church. When When he commands us in scripture, it is the standard will of God, meaning that it applies, it is applicable to every Christ follower. There are certain things that God says, thou shalt not do, And there are certain things he says thou shalt do that are applicable to everyone in the room if you are a Christ follower. It falls under the category of what I'm going to call the standard will of God. It's no-brainer stuff. I know I'm supposed to pray as a Christ follower. I know I'm supposed to read the Bible as a Christ follower. I know I need to contribute my resources as a Christ follower. I know I need to give my time as a Christ follower. So there are things that are the standard will of God that I don't really need to pray about or process because it's commanded and expected and it flies up under what we call his standard will for our life. So you've got the sovereign will of God. You have the standard will of God. And then where I want to spend our time this morning together is on this third area called the specific will of God. That's where he has something definite for you and me to do. Now, I can tell you what I know about the specific will of God, and it relates to the standard will of God, and that is this. He is, according to 2 Peter 3, 9, he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What is the standard will of God that impacts the specific will of God? It is the will of God that you know him. He is not willing, 2 Peter 3, 9, that any, he didn't say many, he said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I can tell you this morning, this much I know about the will of God for your life, he wants you to know him. And for some of you in the room, the reason you're here this morning might be an opportunity for you to trust him. He might have brought you here this morning so you could hear me say to your heart, it's not your religion, it isn't your ability to be righteous, it isn't the rules or the rituals of life that you follow, it is your relationship with Jesus that matters. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father 
except by me, Jesus said. So I'm saying I know the will of God begins with a relationship with him. In fact, if you don't know him, the rest of this won't make a lot of sense to you. But if you do know him, then you understand you've stepped through the threshold of beginning to comprehend his plan for your life, his design for your life, his destiny for your life. Look at the Apostle Paul. I referred to him a moment ago. You look at the Apostle Paul, who was a religious terrorist. He was persecuting Christians, and in Acts 9, he's on the road to Damascus going about the thing he was good at, and that was putting Christians to death. And so as the Apostle Paul is on his way, this light shines from heaven. The voice out of the light is the voice of God who says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And in that exchange and on that road, the apostle, Saul became the Apostle Paul as he gave his heart to Christ. And what's interesting when you read the narrative is one of the very first things Saul says to God before he changed his name to Paul, he says to him, what will you have me to do? Once he was connected to God in a relationship, he was interested in knowing God's specific plan for his life. And when you read a little farther over into Acts chapter 10, you see God sent him to a preacher. He sent him to a priest. He sent him to a, a, to a, a prophet. And he basically says, Paul, I want you to receive him because he is a chosen vessel unto me. He will carry the gospel into the Gentile world. Now, what do you get from that? What you get from that is, the, once God had the Apostle Paul in a, or Saul in a relationship with him, he, he changed his name to Paul. He became the great Apostle Paul. But right at the threshold of that relationship with Jesus Christ, he understood that God had a specific plan for his life. God said, he's a chosen vessel for me. Have you ever considered yourself a chosen vessel? That God has something specific for you to do? You are a chosen vessel. God has a plan for your life. There's no one in the world that can do the thing he has created you and designed you and destined you to do. He has a race for you to run. He has something for you to achieve. In fact, if you have a Bible, look at what we're going to use as our text this morning. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, and look at the two verses here. And in it, I want you to capture this idea of a specific plan for your life. Notice what he says, therefore. Now understand in scripture, when you see the word therefore, always look and see what it's there for. It connects what he has just said with what he's about to say. Now what has he just said? He's just talked about the greatest way to overcome fear is faith. Hebrews 11 is the great faith chapter of the Bible. In it, it talks about all of the heroes of faith and all of them succeeded and all of them uh, thrived because of their faith. The biggest killer of fear in your life is your faith. That's why we say funnel your fears through a focus of your faith. Faith is so important to combating fear. Your faith in God, your faith in his word, your faith in his plan for, for your life, your faith in the promises that he's given that he'll never leave you or forsake you. That there's nothing you face today that God cannot, through the power of his Holy Spirit, bring you through it as more than a conqueror. Faith. So he says, because of the faith that we've talked about in chapter 11, because of that, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, let me just step aside a moment to tell you what I think that's talking about. He's just talked about all of the heroes of faith throughout scripture in Hebrews 11. And now he puts it in context as though they've passed off of the scene. And now they've kind of taken their place in the grandstands. And he kind of describes heaven as being kind of a, a, a viewing place where those in heaven are aware to some extent of the things that happen on the earth. Now, let me walk out a little bit on a theological limb. Don't saw it off behind me till I explain myself, okay? I do believe there is an extent, uh, I, I do believe there's a degree, put it this way, uh, to which a person in heaven has information about the things that go on here on the earth. Now, I don't believe, and I'll explain it, I don't believe God would allow information into heaven that would make heaven less heaven for anyone who's there. But I do believe he would allow information into heaven that would make heaven more heaven for people who are there. 
You remember the verse where he says, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels when one sinner repents. Now, sometimes we in music have erroneously interpreted that verse to say the angels rejoice, and they very well may. But that's not what the verse says. It didn't say the angels rejoices when a sinner repents. It says there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Who are in the presence of the angels? This cloud of witnesses. All of those people who've gone on before. Now, let me give you my theory. (laughs) And this is free, but here's my theory. My theory is who would rejoice more in heaven to hear about a sinner repenting on the earth than someone in heaven who had a relationship with the sinner on the earth, okay? Let me color that a little more. Let's say a family member has prayed and prayed and prayed for the salvation of a loved one, and they never saw that happen in their lifetime. They died never seeing that loved one give their heart to Christ. Maybe it was a grandmother who said, my will is and my prayer is that all my grandbabies will know Jesus one day. And that grandmother was taken to heaven before she saw the fruition of that prayer. Can you imagine what heaven would be like for the grandmother to be summoned to the throne of God to say, I want you to know your great-grandchild just gave their heart to Jesus over in the Met Kids place on a Sunday morning. Wouldn't you believe there could be some rejoicing in the presence of the angels over a sinner that repents? I don't know, it's just me, I kind of like that. So anyway, there's, that's free. That was the free part. Now, this costs you some money here. No, I'm just kidding. Here's, he said, since you're surrounded with this cloud of witnesses, let's lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And here's the phrase I wanted you to get. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Meaning you and I have a specific race that we are run, to run. Remember last week I talked about Paul when he described the finishing of his course in 2 Timothy 4. I fought the fight, I kept the faith, I finished my course. He didn't finish the race, he finished his part of it. The idea is Paul had a race, we have a race to run. And I I talk about this a lot when I do a memorial service, but when you go out to the cemetery, you notice on the tombstone, there is the name of the person uh, whose body is interred. And you also see on that tombstone, two dates. The day in which that person was born and the day in which that person died and separating those two dates is a little dash. And that little dash represents the lifetime of a person. Think about it. Our life is a dash between two dates. It is the race between two dates. Every time the Bible speaks of physical life, the shortness shortness of it, the uncertainty of it is always emphasized. James says it's like a tale that's been told. The psalmist said it's like a a dream. He said it's like grass that grows in the spring and withers in the fall. It's a race. It goes by so quickly. And Paul is saying every one of us in the room, we have a race to run. And as we're running the race in verse 2, he says, we look to Jesus, who's the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and now he's finished. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we have a race to run. So how do we discern, how do we determine so that we then can do the race that is before us? First of all, it involves our direction. Being able to discern divine direction. That's the first thing. If I'm going to determine what does God want me to do, then I have to know direction. Now, let me help you with this. And I touched this a little early, but but let me come back to it. The way you can discover the specific will of God is to do the general will of God. Start there. If you're not faithful in doing the things that you know you should do, then God will not reveal to you the things that you do not yet know that you should do. In other words, if I will do what I know I'm supposed to do, God will begin to reveal the things that I do not at this moment yet know that I am supposed to do. Does that make sense? In John 7, 17, he says, if you have a will to know the Father's will, then you will know the Father's will. Let me give it to you another way. If you will to know God's will, you will know God's will. (laughs) You have to have a will to know it. So what do I do this morning? If I'm not sure the direction, trajectory of my life, what do I do? I do what I know I should do. I I do what I know. You you, you made a good start being here this morning, being in church, right? But but don't blow it when you leave here. (laughs) Love your family. Do something good for somebody else. 
Tip that waiter or waitress real good when you go to eat in a little while. (laughs) Be nice to the people you encounter. Recognize God has placed you as salt and light in this world. There's somebody's life you can make better. There's someone you can bless. Those are in the general will of God. Those are things generally we all agree that we know to do. And I'm just saying to find direction, if I will do the things each day I know I should do, then God begins to turn the dial. He begins to help me focus on the specific things that he has for my life, the things that he wants me to do. So it starts with discerning divine direction, okay? So it begins with direction, being able to, listen to Proverbs 4, 18. This is a great verse that would help you. Proverbs 4, 18 says, the path of the just, let me read this. The path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more under the perfect day. Now, what he was driving at, Solomon was writing, saying that to, to, to find the will of God, it's like, let me give it to you in this term. It'd be like walking down the beach early in the morning, right? Right at sun up. And you just have just enough light to illuminate the shoreline. And you're walking down the beach, and, it, and every moment that passes, it's getting brighter and brighter. A new day is rising. And he says, that's a lot like the will of God. You walk in the light that you have, and he'll give you increased light. You're obedient in the areas that you know, and he'll give you other areas to be obedient in. You take advantage of the opportunities that he's given you, he'll give you more opportunities. You are faithful in that which is little, and he'll trust you with that which is great. You see? So in other words, to discern this direction, I walk in the light that he's given me, I do the things that I know I should do, and God will increase my responsibility. And increasing responsibility, he increases opportunity. In fact, he even says, and he goes on to say in Romans 8, 14, as many who are as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons and daughters of God. So to be led by the Spirit of God is proof that I belong to him. So have this idea in mind. First of all, you get direction. And in the direction, the second thing you get is discernment discernment. Now that's when you're trying to get specific. That's when you're really trying to narrow your focus to say, okay, God, I'm doing the general things and now I'm feeling like I'm sensing the opportunities I have to do some specific things. And in order to know how to do that, you need great discernment. You need great discernment. Discernment comes from having, first of all, a clean heart. Uh, There doesn't need to be anything between you and your God. When you read 1 John 1, you read verses 5 down through verses 9, he talks about the significance of a Christ follower living before God with a clean heart. Uh, It involves a clean heart. So, So think about it this way. Discernment involves confession. It involves consecration. It involves concentration. In other words, I'm totally focused on the thing I believe God would have me to do. Discerning. Discerning. Um, One of the ways you can discern the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life is to understand how the Holy Spirit works. Remember the verse I gave you just a moment ago in Romans? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. How does the Spirit of God work? He leads you. you. You know how you can tell the difference between Holy Spirit prompting and unholy spirit um activity in your life is is pretty simple. God will lead you, the devil will pressure you. God will lead you, the devil will push you. If you're looking for discernment to make a decision in your life, let me ask you, do you feel pressured or pushed into the decision or do you feel led to make the decision? I mean, that's significant. I mean, I would tell you this morning, if you're feeling pressure or pushed, then you ought to tap the brake a little bit on your life and try to, again, discern, is this the direction I should take? I feel pressured to do this. I feel pushed into this. Because when God works, he doesn't work through pressure or pushing. He will lead you. In fact, Isaiah said, he gently leads those. It's the analogy of a shepherd with the sheep. I've given this to you before, but he refers to Christ followers as sheep. We're not cattle. (laughs) I mean, if we were cattle, he would talk about pushing them, driving them. That's how you move cattle. You push them, you drive them. You get behind them and push them. You you do that with sheep, you know what happens? They scatter, they go everywhere. You get behind sheep and try to push sheep, pressure sheep, they'll go everywhere. Some of them will just fall over. 
<laughs> they really will. They'll just fall over. And did you know if a sheep becomes cast, if that sheep rolls over on its back, it cannot right itself. It has to be rolled over. It'll die on its back. Now, can I just take one more sidebar with you and tell you? Of all the animals in the world he could have compared us to, sheep. They're some of the dumbest animals that he ever made. Think about that. Dumb. dumb. You don't ever hear about a trained sheep, do you? Besides that, they don't strike fear in the heart of anyone. You've never seen anybody's school. We're the fighting sheep, you know. Maybe a ram, you know, I get that. But a sheep, really? We're the fighting ewes. We're coming after you, you know. I mean, ooh, ooh that's scary. Sheep. I mean, they just don't strike fear in the heart of anybody. And yet, that's what he says we're like. We're like sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray. He's the shepherd that leads the sheep. So back to my point, my point is if you try to push sheep, they scatter. If you try to drive sheep, they go everywhere. How does a shepherd do it? He leads them. My sheep hear my voice, he said, and they know me. We were in Israel several years ago and watched shepherds as they brought literally hundreds and hundreds of sheep into a meadow down into this valley to feed. And the shepherds were up on the hillside. We were with the guides and watching the sheep. It was really an amazing thing to watch. And someone in the groups asked the guy, they said, all those sheep, how, how will they ever figure out what sheep goes with which group? You know, I mean, they're all out there amongst one another. And it was a great question. And I thought about that too. I thought, gosh, how do you tell which ones are yours and which one belongs? You know, he goes, he goes, it's a beautiful thing to watch. He said, hopefully we'll be here long enough for you to see it. He said, because each of those sheep uh, know the uh, specific voice of their shepherd. One of the shepherds had this little wooden flute, and he began to play this little flute as he walked away. And out of that, out of that flock of sheep, all these sheep began to peel out and follow the, 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 the song that this shepherd was playing. They began to go after their shepherd. Another shepherd began to sing. He would just call out. He would sing. And these sheep began to pull out of the big flock and follow after their, the voice of their shepherd. And it was a beautiful thing to observe how each of the sheep knew the voice of their shepherd. He didn't go in there and go, you're mine, get this one out of here, and, ah, move my, no, no, no. He went in there, he, he led them. He was in front of them, leading them. How do you discern the Holy Spirit? He will lead you. He'll lead you. If you've been praying about it and you're seeking God on it, you will know it when it's time to do it, whatever that means to whatever you're going through. If you tune in and you say, God, I, I want to know what you want me to do. Maybe you're past that. Maybe you already know what he wants you to do. You just don't know when to do what he wants you to do. Maybe you're at that phase. I'm saying if you'll be discerning when the time comes, you'll know. You'll know. And I'm not being all, you know, ethereal, esoterical weirdness here. I'm just saying you'll know. You'll know. And then the last thing. It involves our discipline. Our discipline. To know the direction of God for my life requires me to be disciplined. I have to actually, I have to do it. When Jesus was praying and he was saying to us, this is how you pray in Matthew 6. Remember what he said? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. What's the next phrase? Thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is where? In heaven. He said, just as his will is being done in heaven, his will can be done on earth. That's a great way to pray. Say, Lord, I want to dis discipline myself each day to discern, um, to know, to do your will. And friend, if you live your life that way, you can live your life fearless in the face of the choices that you make every day of your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that is powerful, but practical. As James said, we can do it. So help us not to hear it and not do it, but to hear it and do it. For my friends here this morning who know you, Father, I pray they will have received something from you through the worship or through your word that will give them direction, that will give them discernment, that will encourage them to be disciplined, to do the thing you're leading them to do. 
And Lord, for those this morning who've never trusted you, Father, I pray this would be the moment that they realize it is your will that they know you. So in the closing moments of this service, I pray they'll swallow their pride. I pray they'll humble their heart. And they'll pray a simple prayer like this. And pray, Lord Jesus, I believe you died on a cross for my sin. I believe you rose on Easter. And this morning in this room, I give my heart to you. I want to know your plan for my life. I want to know direction for my life. But I want to know you more than anything. Father, may that be their prayer. And help us all to leave a little while to go out into the world to make a difference as salt and light. And help us, Father, each of us to discern your direction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.